Thought Forum. My name is Brian Fields. I'll be your host for today. And with me is my co-host, uh, Pam Zerba. Hello. Happy Darwin Day to everybody. Happy Darwin Day, Brian. Uh, happy Darwin Day to you, Pam. Um, today is February 12th. Uh, this is our first show for the month of February. We'll be having a, another show in two weeks as well. Uh, today, I'd like to open up with uh, some news, as, as I usually do. Uh, the first item on my list here is a Lutheran pastor who apologized for being a good guy. Um, after the, the Newtown shootings in, in Connecticut, there were a number of interfaith vigils, uh, interfaith meaning a whole bunch of different religious faiths getting together to uh, present a community of people who are caring about something. And in this case, uh, uh, a Lutheran minister decided to join in this event and uh, take part to, you know, help the community and, and be a decent guy and, and get together with other uh, uh, religious faiths to show that people can come together for a good cause. The problem is that the, uh, it apparently gave the impression that he endorsed the beliefs of those who came from non-Lutheran backgrounds. So. By sharing the stage with false teachers, as he put it, he diminished the proclamation of the truth, which is theirs by grace through faith in Christ. Isn't it, I, I think he was, he is young and relatively new in this particular church, which is part of the problem I suspect too, that he's the young kid, he's new, and here he is running off doing interfaith stuff. What the heck's wrong with him, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, we've done interfaith stuff before. Um, uh, there are a lot of atheists, and actually we do have some concerns about this too, that have problems with the concept of interfaith, uh, uh, implying that only good works could be done by people of faith working together. We, we disagree with that strongly. But uh, there, I think I've covered on this show that there was a group down in Hagerstown that, that recognized that people of no faith can also contribute, and they changed their uh, uh, charter to allow for humanist and atheist groups to get involved. And so we, we decided to uh, participate in that. Uh, but even still, you know, anytime where you have people of different beliefs working together, being in the same room and communicating, it's always a good thing. And it is a good thing, but it always seems to me that you get to a point pretty quickly where the kumbaya moment passes. And oh, you sure. realize you're at a wall. You know, this yeah. is something that we can't go past and something that you can't go past. I also think the other thing I thought about that, that story about the poor Lutheran minister is that there's a tendency for everybody to think that, well, we're all reasonable people and we'll all get along and we all want to cooperate. There are people out there who don't want to cooperate. There are people out there who don't really want to get along. I think that's also illustrated by the Boy Scout story where oh, yeah. the Boy Scouts were going to have what seemed to be a fairly reasonable compromise to the whole issue of whether or not you could have gay, stu uh, gay Boy Scouts and gay leaders. And guess what? The religious group said, no, we're not really interested in them. We're not trying to be reasonable. They have a different agenda. And I think people who aren't caught up in that religious agenda don't realize that, don't understand. Yeah, they, they get caught in the crossfire when, right. you know, when thinking, well, you know, th there's something that often happens where when people who are especially in religious groups they they have their own personal morality that thing that is building themselves that that feels right mm -hmm. you know this is the right thing to do because why wouldn't it be the right thing to do but the problem happens sometimes when that intersects with religious dogma mm -hmm. the idea uh, because you know religions at their very nature divide people they they create that in group out group thing that you see in a lot of things uh, a lot of uh, institutions but uh, so they're not alone, but in this case, you know, when when that division, those things that, mm -hmm. that are set up to try and divide us, because you don't want to be part of the outgroup, mm -hmm. uh, intersects with morality, uh, we treat people a certain way because they're human beings and we want to be decent human beings. We want to treat people right. And so... Uh, when that intersects, you can cut. You, there's all sorts of, of problems that, that result like this, where now you've got to apologize because you <laughs> did the right thing, um, because you wouldn't want to offend 
people who find it important for you to be sectarian or to uh, uh, be split off from 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 the, the right thing. And I, yeah, I think the people who actually go to church, which is, as we all know, a smaller and smaller number, a lot of them are getting much more sensitive about the fact that their church has a set of absolute beliefs, and that's important. That's kind of why they still go to that church. That That's what their reasoning is. And I don't think, I think they are really uncomfortable, much more uncomfortable than most of us realize with broaching, you know, changing those beliefs or challenging those beliefs. That's why they stay. It's important to them. Um, I, I just want to remind everybody that this is a call-in show. We are live. And uh, if you have any comments about what we're saying, if you agree with us, if you disagree with us, even if you strongly disagree with us, please give us a call. We want to talk to you. Uh, the number is on your screen right now. It's 717-846-5067. Please give us a call and, and uh, uh, chime in. Um, the next item on my list here, and I, I bring this up because... Well, it'll become apparent in a moment. But there is a new documentary that has been released online for free called Sophia Investigates the Good News Club. <laughs> it's an insider's look at a Christian group that tries to set up evangelical ministries in public elementary schools. Now, these groups are pretty common. They, 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 they take advantage of, of open access laws that allow uh, groups to go into schools. Mm -hmm. Most community groups don't really get all that much involved in, in elementary schools, with a few exceptions, like uh, the Boy Scouts and, and some others. But the thing is that schools do, when they do this, they have to provide equal access, and normally they don't have to, or normally they have to not give substantial support to putting the message out there, or at least over and above what they would mm -hmm. give any other group that approached them. Well, the good news clubs have have taken advantage of this in, in several districts and uh, take the opportunity to take your children, uh, not just my children, but your children, and preach a message that you may not dis you may not agree with. A lot of these messages that they put out there are very very fundamentalist in nature. Mm -hmm. They are uh, uh, they're very hate filled. They're very sectarian. Uh, a lot of a lot of people who uh, uh, may not realize what their kids would be getting involved with. Which, yeah, Good News Club sounds very harmless. Oh, yeah. They're not. No. <laughs> I know, but if you were just like, oh, Good News Club, yeah, honey, that sounds fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and they're, they're, they're set up that way. They're set up, you know, all of their friends go and, you know. And they uh, probably have candy. And oh, yeah. Um, you know, most people who ran into this situation with their kids would, would when, they, when they look at this, they would say, oh, well, yeah, it's, it's a Christian group. It should be sure. fine. But you have to remember that the people running these groups are complete strangers. They are not, they, they, they are, and they're not from your church. They're from the particular uh, denomination that's putting this together, which, again, is a very fundamentalist uh, organization. But even still, uh, we got a report that I that I gave. I think it was the last time I was here about a good news club up in the Lock Haven area that uh, was doing the same thing. They were they sent home flyers with the with the kids, and uh, one of our friends g whose kid goes to the district got the flyer and told us about what was going on. And it was actually it was funny because it was in opposition to the district's established policy. Hmm. Their written policy is, we don't allow this. <laughs> so he wrote a letter saying, this is against your policy. And they responded back saying, well, we don't think they did anything wrong because we'll do this for anybody. So they have, <laughs> they're enacting a de facto policy that's in opposition to the policy that they've established. Well, and which is, and the policy they now say they have is insane. Yeah. Because, and, and they don't mean it. I mean, if the Ku Klux Klan comes in, presumably they would not let them present things to the children, I would assume. But they'd have to. Oh, they'd, if that's their policy, yes, they would. They'd have to. The Communist Party could come in and give things to the children. So the reason why I bring this up is uh, Timothy Havener, uh, being a friend of ours mm -hmm. and uh, being informed of what the school's policy is, decided that he's going to try and set up a, a, a viewing of... Sophia investigates the Good News Club for the school. <laughs> My um, guess is Sophia finds out a couple of unpleasant things about the Good News Club. Yes. Yeah. So uh, um, 
we're going to uh, we're going to look into that, and uh, we'll 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 keep you guys uh, informed as to what happens. But but it should be interesting. Yes, it'd be interesting to hear the reaction of the schools when they get a load. Now again, maybe they won't realize that the movie is opposed to the Good News Clubs, which would also oh, be it's going to be on the flyer. Oh, good. Okay. Oh yeah, Good. but it it'll be it, it'll be a an expose. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> um, another an, in in other movie news, uh, the new movie a new movie called The Unbelievers uh, by Black Chalk Productions uh, was released recently. It uh, features Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, uh, two very intelligent men. Uh, who uh, travel around the world and speak about the importance of science and why we don't need religious ideas in the modern wa world? <laughs> I haven't I haven't watched it myself, but I mean it, it's something I would recommend that people go check out. Um, With Dawkins, you don't go wrong. Right? Yeah. Or Lawrence Krauss, as far as that goes. He's Lawrence very... Krauss has has a very very fascinating talk he gives at a lot of conferences about uh, how the universe could have resulted from nothing. Uh, he's got a book out, I think, called... Oh, I think I've heard that. Uh, I think it's called A Universe from Nothing. You, you should check it out on Amazon uh, or just look up Lawrence Krauss if, if I've got the title wrong. But uh, it's, a, it's a very... It, I've, I've seen his talk. The talk is very engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives you a lot of information that, that, I mean, I had never heard before, but... And it's, it's understandable even if you don't have a college degree in one of the sciences, uh, right. which I do not, but he doesn't lose you. He keeps yeah. you right up there with, with him. Uh, uh, circling back to another story that, that I brought up before, uh, the FFRF and the ACLU of Ohio have sold, sued a school district out there about the middle school's giant portrait of Jesus that hangs over uh, the, on the wall. The FFRF uh, have decided to go ahead, and the ACLU have go ahead, have gone ahead and, and actually filed the suit. Apparently, they weren't able to reach an agreement with the school district that involved taking the portrait down. Um, some of the stuff that I'm reading on this, or I've read on this, it has indicated that uh, the district wasn't really ready to be sued. They apparently were looking for solutions that included the portrait not coming down, but they didn't apparently count on the idea that that is a, a line that is not acceptable. That's really, I mean, don't these people have lawyers? I, I can see occasionally you'll run into one of these situations where there'll be something that is a little gray, but that's not a gray area. That's right. not even close to a gray area. What planet are they on? I, I have no idea, and it, it, and it is absolutely nuts. I mean, um, look, public school district, there is plenty of things to be teaching the kids and and you know i don't care who you are you know look if they hung up a, a giant picture of uh another god uh, uh, buddha. Or, or, or buddha or you know uh some of the hindu gods or or whatever up there in a place of veneration and when when i say up there the, the if you ever see the picture, if you go out online, you'll see there's a big overlook where it hangs, like looking over everybody, you know, where it, it's an object of adoration, even. If, if Muhammad, uh, a picture of Muhammad. Well, I was going to say, that, no that, pictures of Muhammad. <laughs> that that, that uh, uh, probably wouldn't happen. Um, but even still. Um, but yeah, they, 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 they don't. Uh, uh, there's, there's just no way that anybody would find that acceptable if it were from a religion that was not your own religion. Well, we had the example of people not understanding that uh, from in Louisiana, where they're giving money to um, schools that are religiously based, and one of the politicians in Louisiana, I'm sorry to say a woman politician, was shocked to learn that there were non-Christian schools that were religious. In this case, I believe they were... Um, Islamic schools, and that money was going to go to them. It was ju it just amazed. There are people out there who don't realize that there are religions other than Christian religions, that, and that we've got all these laws and all this case law and years and years and years of winning these lawsuits. You know, it, it's just amazing to me. Yeah, it, it's, it's spitting into the wind. Yeah. You know, it, it's just, in, it's crazy. Um, well, 
in the loving Christian uh, uh, department, we have a group of Christian students and their parents from Sullivan High School in Sullivan, Indiana, don't want to go to their own prom because gay students are allowed to attend. Oh, yes, I read about that. Uh, so yesterday, uh, wait, uh, I guess that was two days ago, they gathered at the First Christian Church to make plans for an alternative prom that would ban gay students. Now, this is especially offensive, not just because, you know, they have a problem with, with uh, homosexuality, period. Look, I, I, you know, could even conceive of the behavior that would say, well, we're going to ban uh, same-sex dates, although I would disagree with it and I would think that, that it's wrong in its own class. But this is a special class of wrong. <laughs> okay. It, it, it's, let's take what's already wrong and make it another dimension of let's wrong. Let's make sure everybody knows how, yeah, let, let's go all the way and make sure we uh, marginalize people, make sure we make yeah. a point of our own bigotry. Yes. Um, if the student is gay, they aren't allowed to attend. Whether they're with their date or not, they're not allowed to attend. Oh, and that's really interesting. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. They're banning gay students. Not gay relationships or gay dates or anything. possibly be legal. Well, the thing is, they're, they're making plans. It's the students oh, I see. It's through at the a church. church. You're right. It's at a church thing. But it, right. it's a special class of bigotry. Yes. You know? I, I mean, we're, we're going back into the territory of the 1960s where black kids weren't allowed to attend the prom or, or attend mm -hmm. the school or to, you know, the various other things. You know, it, this is, this is uh, their idea was to create a separate traditional prom. Um, they said that there's several others from their high school who agree but are afraid to take a stand. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and here's, here's, a, here's a pretty awful quote from one of the students. <laughs> If we can get a good prom, then we can convince more people to come and follow what they believe. And again, this is just where sometimes those of us who don't run in Christian circles, or conservative Christian circles at least, think that, well, everybody is on the same page with this stuff, everybody understands bigotry is wrong. No, everybody doesn't. There are a lot of people out there for whom this is a, still a really big deal and who are willing to be mean-spirited and bigoted and whatever adjective you care to supply there. Uh, there is a world out there that we sometimes I think pretend doesn't exist. Right. But it's out there. Well, one of the students said, we want to make pu the public see that we love the homosexuals, but we don't think it's right, nor should it be publicly accepted. Oh, I see, but they love them. Right. That's nice to know. Yeah. We, we don't want you to be anywhere near us. That's right. We don't want you within 10 feet of us, but we love you. Right. <laughs> I'm sure the poor gay students at that high school are really reassured and comforted by that. Yeah. Um, some, some actual good news in, in the uh, bigotry department. <laughs> um, the, over the last few weeks, there's been a lot of news about several uh, Westboro Baptist Church members uh, leaving the church and speaking out about the church. Um, Megan Phelps Roper and her sister Grace and then also uh, a former WVC member, uh, Lauren Drain, is is actually being featured in uh, Prop 8. Uh, oh, eight, no, I'm sorry, it's not Prop 8. It's the No Hate Campaign, which is uh, uh, a direct campaign in opposition to the WVC. Uh, so it, it's, it's good to note that even though you have this insular cult, that there are people leaving the church and they're being very vocal about the, the, the nasty stuff going on there. Fred Phelps has, Phelps has to be 90 years old. I, well, his daughter, his daughter is, when, when he's gone, his daughter, I think, will hold things together for at least oh. a while. Uh, Shirley, Shirley yeah. Phelps Roper. She, she, she will hold it together for a little bit, but I think over time that uh, uh, it, it will fall apart. Uh, you know, at some point she'll retire and then, then it's done. Yeah, if, if the grandkids aren't interested then, yeah, I would think it, they have a limited shelf life, but that's can't come soon enough, of course, but it's hard to imagine that Fred's still well, I've been kicking. Uh, one other good bit of news. Uh, in Oklahoma, f since 1909, they, they had a law sent prohibiting blasphemy, which is still stands to this day. <laughs> but a Republican is actually 
um, uh, putting forth a bill, uh, Randy Grau is putting forth the bill to repeal the blasphemy law, a uh, Republican. Why? Uh, essentially, he, he says part of his goal is to get rid of unnecessary laws, Tea Good. Party. Uh, but he, he says he's not pro-blasphemy, <laughs> but he, he essentially says he's saying that he, he believes that, that in order for everybody to freely exercise their religion, that law prohibits the free exercise as well as free speech. Well, good so, for him. So I, I'd say that that's a good that that's good to know that that he that he's going to go ahead and mm -hmm. he's going to do that. I think that's a good thing. Blasphemy laws are ridiculous. Uh, there have been actually repeated calls around the world from uh, mainly Muslim uh, countries for a UN resolution against blasphemy. I have to say that that our president has said that. Uh, we have a, a First Amendment in this country, and that that laws against blasphemy are uh, run fully counter to that. And it's you know, it's in our founding documents that that this would be wrong. So I'm always amazed to be reminded that Ireland has a blasphemy law. Think of Ireland as a relatively developed state, you know, and the fact that they do in fact still have a blasphemy law on the books is simply amazing. It's one of the things when Pennsylvania non-believers marches in St. Patrick's Day Parade, that is our connection to Ireland. It is that we are protesting the Irish blasphemy law. Right, and we, we have a banner we usually put up uh, for that. Um, so, I, that, that concludes most of the news I have, except uh, there, there, was some, there was an announcement <laughs> I think happened yesterday. The big retirement. Yeah. Yes. And did you see a lightning bolt struck the Vatican yeah. yesterday? Yeah. So that apparently, the, apparently there's a cause and effect there some way, but nobody's sure if what, what caused what. If the retirement caused the lightning bolt or if the lightning bolt caused the, re, uh, the retirement. Apparently this is a serious topic of conversation in Italy at the moment. However, as I'm sure everybody has heard, our good friend, Pope, um, what is his name? Pope just flipped out on it. Benedict? Benedict. I think of him as John Ratzinger. Anyway, Pope Benedict has announced that he is going to retire. This is a really odd thing in terms of Catholic theology, and it's made people sort of uncomfortable. Of course, Catholic spokesmen are saying, oh, it's wonderful, it shows what a conscientious person he is. But the fact is, and I was happy to hear Stephen Colbert say this last night, when God wants you to retire, he has a way of letting you know. You know, you just keel over in a little heap. The idea here is that he has been designated by God. When they vote for him, they get together and God inspires them. It apparently it really isn't like the a Chicago automatic election, although that is kind of what I think it's really like. But the Pope isn't supposed to retire. And there's some concern within the church about what um, what happens next, the next time a Pope isn't feeling well, the next time a Pope isn't popular. And this Pope is not hugely popular. Benny the Pope, as I'm being reminded, isn't the most popular guy in the whole world. And there's some thought that he's 85, he didn't want to be Pope, he took it as a caretaker, and he has apparently lived longer than he thought he was going to, so he's just given up. I think it's also possible that he wants to have some say in who succeeds him. That if he dies and then they vote, obviously he has no control, although he might believe he can come back and haunt them and get them to vote for who he wants, but be that as it may. So it's just a really odd thing. As everybody knows, it's been a very long time. The last time a pope resigned, it was when the Catholic Church was going through the schism and there was a pope in Avignon and there was a pope someplace else. So one of the popes resigned so that they could come back to having only one pope. Prior to that was in the 12th century, I believe, and it's relatively similar to this situation. The pope in question had uh, been a monk, was a studious person who did not wish to be pope, and after a relatively short time as pope said, you know, I don't like this, and I'm just giving it up, and went back to his um, uh, monastery. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about who might succeed the, this pope. Now, the thing is, by no stretch of the imagination, um, is it going to be a liberal person? In fact, I understand there's a, they've placed an ad. Yeah, there, there's an ad out there for, for Pope. So let me read the requirements so that if there's any any oh, yeah. candidates out, out, if out, anybody wants out in to our, apply. our audience here who, who might want to apply. So, so let, me, let me read the ad that, that uh, it's, it's from the Science, Reason, and Critical Thinking blog, just, just to give the right reference here. But the ad is for the pontiff, 
Um, the money is excellent, plus many benefits. It's Rome-based with some international travel. Our leading international client in the faith sector is urgently seeking a highly credulous and experienced spiritual leader to lead the organization backwards to the dark ages. This position would suit any dogmatic individual with a flair for ignoring empirical evidence. Any experience of covering up sexual abuse scandals would be highly desirable. Homophobic and misogynistic applicants are welcome. Bulletproof ice cream van, silly hat, and red slippers are supplied. You may be required to work some weekends and bank holidays. Fallible candidates need not apply. The Holy See is not an equal opportunity employer. You know, one of the things that that mentions that other people have talked about is he's still going to be um, infallible when he is no longer pope. I would think not, but it's not an issue that's come up very often because they didn't say the popes were infallible back when the last two resigned. That's a relatively recent um, change in the church. If, in fact, you are betting people and are interested in laying off some money on this, I got, in Britain, they'll bet on anything, and I got British betting odds on the candidates. Um, they say that Francis Arinze, who is from Nigeria, is their number one candidate. He's of 4.5, that's pounds, of course, to one. He's from Nigeria, as I said. He's, however, 80 years old, so I really think they're wrong about that. I think the British betting public is not correct. I think he's too old. Um, they have next, also at 4.5, Marc Boulet. He is a cardinal from Canada. Again, whether they're going to have a, can a candidate from the northern hem from North America, I think, is very unlikely. The source I have, uh, Irish bookmaker Patty Power, uh -huh. set uh, Marc Boulet at 3.5. Okay, I still think they're wrong. I think, actually, both uh, Pope Benedict and John Paul II had been have been naming lots of European cardinals. And there was some thought that the reason they did that was to keep the power base in Europe, that they really are not interested in this brave new world stuff where they would have an African pope or a South American pope. I think a South American pope is somewhat more likely. There are a couple of Brazilian cardinals who are possibilities. Um, again, however, it's not like it's going to make a huge difference. None of these guys are really young. About the youngest person I found on my list was um, Leonardo Sandri, who was born in Argentina and who is 59. And the thing is, from the Cardinal's point of view, you appoint a young guy, and generally, again, until very recently, they stayed until death, so you've got somebody who's going to be a pope for 30 years. And do they want that? You know, that gives a lot of power to somebody for a very long time. Maybe they'll be a little happier with somebody who's closer to 70, who maybe we're talking 10 or 15 years. So there are lots of, again, if you're going to put some money down on this, there are things to think about. If I were you, I would look at, um, there are a couple of Italian cardinals. Italians haven't had the papacy for a while, and I think they might be thinking it's time to get it back. Uh, we'll see. Apparently, this is going to happen um, right after his resignation, so in about two weeks. So we'll see, and then the white smoke will come, or the black smoke will come, and everybody will get so excited. You know, I really don't understand why this is such a big news story in the United States. I understand that 24% of the U.S. population identifies as Catholic, but who the Pope is is just not a big key concern to most people's everyday life. It I, is sort of like a big American idol sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, I think, I think Americans uh, who identify as Christian, even if they are Catholic, do kind of venerate at least the, the opinion of the Pope or the office of the Pope in that idea that, that not in not so much as the Christ's vicar on mm -hmm. earth thing, mm -hmm. so much as respecting a religious figure, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, is, that is a powerful religious figure. Uh, you know, presidents throughout American history have consulted uh, at least, you know, tangentially with the Pope on things and, and had, had a working, you know. Actually, that, that's more true recently. There was a lot of concern about whether or not the um, United States should actually recognize the right. Vatican because there was a lot of anti-Catholic feeling in this country until maybe 50 years ago. So it hasn't always been like that, but you're right, it is like that now. We send, a, 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 we have an ambassador to the Vatican of all silly things. Yeah, and, and the presidents have, I mean, uh, consulted with the Pope as much as they consult with uh, who was the, who, who was the, the mega pastor from um, Southern California. Uh, Rick Warren? Yeah, they've consulted with Rick Warren, they've consulted with uh, 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 
what's his name? The the Oh hell. <laughs> Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Billy Thank Graham you. Is That's the one, the one I was trying to yeah. think of. Yeah. So I mean uh, most of the presidents have, have have at least, you know, mixed it up, but mm -hmm. But even still, you know, there's there's some recognition of the Pope's power in this country, uh, his his power to make what they would consider to be moral statements. But and the thing is, that's true. Uh, the Pope makes moral statements. He writes encyclicals. But the extent to which this actually has anything to do with most Catholics' everyday life is tiny. Right. I mean, it, it just doesn't have that much impact anymore. It annoys me that. Um, reporters, newspapers, uh, TV shows, still act as if there's a lot of power there. That's somebody, for example, uh, Cardinal Dolan in New York. Cardinal Dolan gets l TV time to talk about he's extremely conservative, and he's conservative for an American Catholic. He's on the more conservative end. And his views are presented as mainstream, and they're presented as if they make a difference to average people. Cardinal Dolan is one of the ones who is leading the charge against um, companies having to provide birth control through Obamacare. That's not, first of all, that there is a lawsuit, but not all the Catholic dioceses are part of that lawsuit. This is on the more conservative end, but Dolan is presented as if he is a real spokesman for everybody, and that people really listen to him. And that's, it's just not true, it hasn't been true for a long time. Catholics are, in fact, still 24%. I found, I heard this today and looked it up, and apparently it is true. If you break down all the Christian sects or all the different religions in this country, so you're not talking about evangelical Protestants, but you're talking about Baptists and Methodists and whatever. If you break that down, former Catholics are the third largest sect in America. Catholics are number one. Evangelical Baptists are number two at about 10.8%. Former Catholics are 10%. Now, former Catholics often wind up in other religions. They're not necessarily a standalone group. But I just think that's really interesting that there are that many. Right. And and the numbers actually show also that atheists rank really highly oh, amongst yeah. amongst those percentages as well. But I, speaking of that, I, I wanted to point out uh, uh, the, the same uh, booking mm -hmm. uh, uh, website that, that I'm quoting actually offers uh, 666 to 1 odds on Richard Dawkins becoming an <laughs> I think that's cute. <laughs> and actually, they could. They don't have to vote for a cardinal. They could vote for a bishop, for example. I mean, they could also vote for Richard Dawkins if they wanted to. Somewhat unlikely. But they could, for example, vote for a bishop who is not a cardinal. Um, I want to see what the odds on cardinal law being the <laughs> Actually, because of his age, I'm, I'm not sure that they would, al that he'd be even eligible because he well, is at least well they would be upfront about you know their their uh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would be and it's interesting that it, if the reports are true where a benedict is going to go live is considerably less nice than where bernard law lives not only do they let the guy flee american law they put him in a castle so you know make sure everybody gets the point on that yeah mm -hmm. and and just to clarify i mean the uh pope benny is intending to go into uh, uh, go into you know go into relative seclusion and and he says that he's going to do a bunch of reading but you know what personally I've always thought he looks a lot like the emperor so I figure uh -huh. that what's going to happen is they're going to take him out of public life and then ship him back off to the galaxy mm -hmm. where the force is in play and that you know they're going to finish the the Star Wars series I think what they, and then they're they'll come out then Disney will release the film that's right because they are making a new bunch of Star Wars movies aren't right. they right Oh, I think I think that actually makes sense. Now you've explained it. Now we know why. Yeah. All right. Good. I, I'm sure the major news services will pick this up because everybody well, they, they, wonders. And now they know. Story. It is a big story. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, the the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, I, I I picked it to be kind of the whipping boy for today because of, <laughs> of uh, uh, what's going on with the Pope. But. I mean, seriously, with with the scandals and the, you know, the, everybody talks about the child the, the child sex scandals, child rape scandals. You know, it, it it's funny. Somebody pointed out to me, you know, that the, the, there are some news outlets that are calling it the sex scandals. Mm -hmm. You know, they say the 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 church's sex scandals, and and I want to be clear here. What we're talking about is the church's child rape scandals. There, there's a, a, a difference between the mm -hmm. two. A sex scandal is what happens when a politician gets caught uh, in bed with the wrong person. 
That's a sex scandal. Right. That involves you know. adults. Yes. Uh, a, a child rape scandal is what happens when children are raped by people who uh, are adults, uh, typically. Well, and in this case, the, the, and, you know, the, it's well known what's going on in the Catholic Church. So I, I wanted to point that out here that th we're not talking about sex scandals. We're talking about child rape. And the fact is that the church has uh, covered it up, moved around priests and all that other stuff. And this has been all over, all over the all over the news. But you know, we have other issues with the Catholic Church, and and I'm hoping that the, that given the influence of the Catholic Church on the world, and especially on the continent of Africa, where mm -hmm. it's really important, mm -hmm. um, that they'll start to modernize uh, some of their views on on things like uh, uh, birth control and uh, uh, condoms. And, and you know, I just think that's extremely unlikely. I, they are holding tight to it. Um, Catholics, I know, will tell you that their, their sense is that the church has decided that maybe we'll be smaller, but we'll be more intense. Uh, there isn't any... So they're going the WBC route? Yeah, basically. Basically. And that's... The thing is, any of these guys, like I said before, doesn't matter if they're from Africa or South America, doesn't matter if they're 59 or if they're 80, nobody is going to be talking about married priests. Nobody is going to be talking about women priests. Nobody is going to be talking about abortion or birth control. That those things are decided and off the table. Nobody's going to be talking about gay marriage. Nobody is going to. There isn't anybody who is going to get to be pope, who is going to have any interest in changing their opinion about any of that kind of thing. Those guys don't get to be cardinals. If you have a liberal mindset, nobody made you a cardinal. All the cardinals who are voting were appointed by either John Paul II or by Benedict. So we know they're conservative, and there's just no, I mean, you can talk about, gee, wouldn't it be great if it's somebody from South America? I don't think it's going to be somebody from South America, but okay, yeah, that'd be nice, I suppose. But it's not going to make any difference in how the church works and how um, things get done. One of the things you hear is that uh, Benedict was picked in part to be a, a, a gay, uh, not a gatekeeper, but um, a caretaker, mm -hmm. Pope, and that toward the end of John Paul II, because he was so ill, a lot of administrative stuff was not getting done. I mean, obviously, the Vatican has a lot to administer. And that Benedict was brought in to fix that up, and that he hasn't done such a great job, that the administration has gotten away from him. He hasn't been real interested in it. There was the scandal about his butler leaking documents to Italian newspapers. Um, I personally don't think his butler did that. I think other people did that. They asked the butler to take the rap, and guess what? They pardoned the butler. Interestingly enough, after he pled guilty. So I, there's a sense that maybe they'd like to bring in somebody who could actually do the administrative stuff better, but there, there really don't, there doesn't seem to be any enthusiasm for making dramatic changes or any impetus. Right. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it wouldn't be such a, you know, w w when we look at the WBC, we can look at the WBC and say, you know, they're crazy. Okay. But they're a small group of around 100 people uh, in one congregation in the middle of the U.S., and they make a lot of noise. But in the bottom line is they don't matter much because everybody knows they're crazy and <laughs> nobody cares uh, because when they say crazy things, we just look at it and say, hey, they're crazy, and it doesn't matter. But when you look at the Catholic Church, what they say does matter. Oh, it does. Uh, oh, kings um... and queens and presidents and... And uh, people around the world look at what the Catholic Church is doing, and they they listen to the church, even when they come up with the craziest things. The Uganda stuff, you know, the, the, uh, the kill the gays stuff, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the Catholic Church didn't back that. But, you know, what you've got here is governments that are paying attention to religious dogma and following up on it, and you've got that with... With uh, uh, and the, with the Catholic Church's influence in Africa for birth control and the, the runaway AIDS epidemic and uh, all of that stuff, you know, that all feeds into to really uh, negative outcome for. Well, and in this country, you've got the stranglehold the Catholic Church has on health care, uh, the effect they're having on Obamacare that uh, they're tying that in knots because of the contraception, the number of Catholic. Um, hospitals in this country. There are approximately 600 hospitals and health, 600 hospitals in this country that are Catholic. And I think this isn't a big issue, or does is it presented as a big issue? Because 
in most big cities, yeah, you've got a couple of ho Catholic hospitals, but you've got others. But there are lots of places in this country where the hospital you go to is the Catholic hospital. And if you me need plan B birth control, if you want a tubal ligation, if you need a late term or any abortion because to save the life of the mother, if you have an advanced directive and it specifies certain things the Catholic Church doesn't agree with, you're just out of luck. I mean, you're, gonna, you're stuck in that hospital. And that's just not right. In Baltimore, there's a hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital, uh, which ran into all kinds of financial problems and was sold to the University of Maryland Medical System. The University of Maryland Medical System, a taxpayer-funded medical system, agreed to let the St. Joseph's facility still obey the dictates of the Catholic Church. So Maryland taxpayers are paying for people not being able to get Plan B, um, again, no abortions even to save the life of the mother, uh, no tubal ligations, and ignoring advanced directives if it doesn't happen to fit in their areas. That's outrageous. Except that in Baltimore, if you don't like it, you've got your choice. There are other hospitals. But that's not true every place, and it's a disgrace. And, you know, that the, you run into situations like in Ireland uh, uh, oh, yeah. about the woman who, who uh, uh, did die, uh, and it was just because they, they uh, you remember the details yeah, on that? Yeah, I do. Uh, she, again, um, she needed to have an abortion. The, there was a problem with the pregnancy. It was relatively late term. The doctors, she and her husband were from India, living in Ireland. They said to the doctors, why won't you do this? The doctors said, this is a Catholic country, we can't. The husband said, we're not Catholic, we don't care. And the doctors said, we're awfully, awfully sorry, but we can, and the woman died. Now, the, cat in, the government in Ireland is investigating this and thinking about making changes. Ireland has gone from an extremely devout Catholic country to a really, really angry Catholic country. There has been so much um, revealed about the church in Ireland over the last 15 years that they've just really, uh, the attendance is down to practically nothing. Um, there are no many, not anywhere near as many priests as there used to be. Um, one of the cardinals I talked about, Mark Ouellet, was sent by the Pope to go there to see if he couldn't help calm everybody down and fix stuff. And it's still a situation where the Catholic, the Catholic Church has, as far as Ireland is concerned, just blown it. Uh, there's no respect and people are really really angry and then there was the uh the, the magdalene uh magdalene laundries yeah that was um and this went until the 1990s mind you what would happen is that girls would get sent to the magdalene laundries it was like a reformatory basically where they did extremely hard work in these laundries they were not well fed they were beaten it was just horrible but not only that it could be a life sentence they weren't sent there by a judge or anything. It wasn't as if uh, the judge said, you'll be there for a year. You were there until a male relative came and took you out. So if you didn't have a male relative who was willing to come and get you, you'd stay there forever. And it was for a wide variety of things. Um, obviously, if you had sex, you were the kind of girl who had to go to the reformatory, so you went to the Madeline Laundry. Sometimes, if you were just yourself illegitimate, if you were uh, mentally challenged, if you had a bad attitude, I mean, there were just all sorts of things, and this went through the 1990s. And obviously, it's it's a you know a terrible disgrace. There is a very good movie which was released, oh, probably seven or eight years ago, uh, The Madeline Laundries. Uh, it will upset you if you see it, but it's an excellent movie. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Catholic Church has a lot to answer for uh, in these areas, and and it's, you know, I asked. The Bishop of Harrisburg uh, a year or two ago, you know, how can, and you know, if any Catholics are listening, please feel free to call in, but how can the church claim moral authority when the church itself appears to have so much that indicates that it's morally bankrupt? I mean, you compare uh, all of these things where, where the institution itself is more important than the safety of children. I mean, we're, we're just to start there, or the safety of uh, a mother, a, a woman's life. You know, um, it, it, it's it, it, when we're talking about risking a woman's life for abortion. Never mind the fact that it's wrong to begin with to to, to risk the life when when there are other alternatives. 
But in most of these cases, when we're talking about the abortion, we're talking about a, 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 when they go to the hospital and they're, they're making that decision of, of whether they need to do an abortion or not, we're talking about the child who is not going to survive anyway. This mm-hmm. is a child that, that is, the, the, the mother's life is in danger. The child will not survive outside of the mother, you know, obviously, mm-hmm. or they would do a, uh, a, a cesarean, a cesarean section. section. I mean, that would be the alternative. So in a case where the cesarean section is not going to be successful, the fetus is not going to survive outside the mother. The mother will die, and so will the fetus. Okay? That, that's the bottom line. We're not talking... We draw the line there, and then we move on. I mean, most people would then say, okay, the fetus isn't going to survive. The mother isn't going to survive if the fetus remains within the mother. The fetus needs to come out, and the abortion needs to happen. Period. Why have two deaths and call yourself a religion that supports life when the alternative is one person survives. We're not talking about the rest of the abortion argument. We can talk about that another time. In that specific circumstance, the Catholic Church would say both need to die, period. That's wrong. (laughs) (laughs) That's wrong. Um, And if you're in a Catholic hospital, it doesn't matter if you're Catholic or not. It doesn't matter if you feel that way. Mm-hmm. Once you're in the Catholic hospital, you abide by their rules. And that's, yeah, another thing I read about the Catholic Church that this just fascinates me. Um, they are very quietly opposed some, to immigration reform. Now, keep in mind, the only thing that is keeping Catholic population in this country at 24% is Spanish, Hispanic immigration, because the immigration reform allows uh, domestic partners. And they can't have that. So, even though it may alienate a major part of their base and basically the group of people that are keeping them going at the moment, they're quietly taking that stand. Now, they are not standing on the rooftops and yelling about that the way they do about, say, abortion, but they are taking that stand. And I think I think that's really interesting. I mean, it, it just shows you that, I don't know, I mean, suicidal tendencies, sort of like West Barrow Baptist. Part, part, part of me, you know... Uh, feel some shade in Freud when they make decisions like this, you know. Uh, you know, they've got it coming. But, you know, part of me also has to respect that, you know, they've got this dogma that is so entrenched that they're going to make a hard decision that, that's based on the dogma regardless. I mean, they're fairly consistent in their mm-hmm. ideals. Uh, so even, you know, they say that they're pro-life for that them. That means that they are going to be anti-abortion, but they're also going to... Uh, uh, oppose well, the death penalty. Although know? it's not as if they call out politicians who favor the death penalty. But, right. But well, they do like they do with the abortion. Right. You right. Know. Um, and and that's been called out a few times. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, again, I mean, it comes back to you know how can you uh, then claim moral authority when you're uh, running priests around to escape the law, like. Cardinal Law, for example, mm. uh, who was sent to the Vatican to avoid uh, even questioning, really, right. uh, uh, regarding the, the scandals in Boston uh, when those were going down. And a lot of this stuff, the other thing, that the standard defense from the Catholic Church is this stuff happened 25, 30 years ago. It's all over now. No, it's not. Um, there was just a case in Kansas City that happened after 2000. So it's not as if everybody's learned and it's all better now and uh, you know it, it, it happened a long time ago don't worry about it no it they haven't really learned and, they... and there's plenty of priests that are still in the system mm-hmm. that are still in the church haven't been defrocked because they resist being def- uh, defrocking their priests because essentially what that means is that they were wrong in uh, ordaining that priest well and they are caught with the problem of having to forgive people too right um they have to forgive them and give them another chance. At least that was the story in the 80s. They don't say that quite so much anymore because they know how stupid it sounds. <laughs> but that was originally the problem they had. Um, yeah, so so in in this case, we have uh, uh, Cardinal, uh, we, we know about Cardinal Law, the fact that he was sent to the Vatican and uh, is living in a palace <laughs> and... Uh, there are plenty of other preachers that there's one in Ireland, I think, that that's still in the system that, yes. that, that he was identified as as being a molester. And he he admits that he did it. 
and uh, he was moved, and the law can't touch him, and he just he's still in the system. But that's the thing, you know, the Catholics, the Catholic Church's mentality is that if you've been forgiven, mm -hmm. you know, or or uh, uh, they they they've you know made their uh, apology or you know they've done their forgiveness, that all of a sudden those sins get washed away and the person is reborn and. No. Well, we know that's not true. We, we know... Certainly do we know it's not true with pedophiles. Yeah. Uh, pedophiles are wired a certain way, and they are going to, given the opportunity, without some intervention, they're going to do it again. Um, you know, so in this particular situation, what you've got is a, backward, a backwards institution using uh, Dark Ages mentality for addressing a, a, this, something that's completely outside of their depth, that science understands, that the modern law understands, but this, this dark ages uh, mentality is being applied to something that it just simply can't handle. Well, and the Catholic Church is very nervous about psychology and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. um, they're very uh, uncomfortable with the idea that because if you start looking at people who have chemical imbalances or people who, because of very bad childhoods, behave in a certain way, you start to ask questions about free will. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, leads the Catholic Church in a place it doesn't want to go. Again, one of the problems when they first started with the, uh, facing a, the abuse scandal a little more organizedly in the 80s, they would send um, the priests to Catholic facilities because they didn't trust sending them to just other normal facilities um, because they were afraid of what would happen. And mm -hmm. my guess is they're afraid that people would be reported and that kind of thing. When you sent them to Catholic facilities, they weren't. And they didn't have any of this troublesome psychology, psychiatry sort of thing. Right. Yeah, you know, if, if people are wired a certain way through, you know, the way their brains get programmed when, when they're brought up through childhood or whether the, it's genetically programmed or, or some mixture in between. If there's behavior that people exhibit that they cannot be held directly responsible for because they are wired that way, then the idea of using free will as an argument for accepting Christ for your sins and or not accepting and then having an internal punishment, both of those, it, it conflicts. There, there, there isn't a direct path then for, for, say, for saying that this person uh, uh, is, is evil and a sinner, or, or just even just a sinner, rather than miswired or broken. Well, and the other interesting thing, this has gotten the Catholic Church into some really semantic loops when you talk about people who are gay, because Catholics do tend to be, a lot of Catholics are educated. There are Catholics who understand things like science and genetics. The Catholic Church now sort of kind of accepts that people are born gay, that it's not a choice. But then you've got this problem where, why did God do that mean thing? If you are making people in a way that condition, that makes them want to behave in a way that you consider sinful, that's a really jerky thing for God to do, you know? It really is. How could you believe in a God that would be that just plain mean? And the Catholic Church doesn't have a good answer for that. They kind of dance around it and say, well, you know, there are things we don't understand and all that kind of uh, silliness. But that, to me, I, the whole question of, and that leads back to why is there evil? If there's a good, all-loving God, how come there's so much the evil Odyssey, in the world? It's, that, that's, it's, it's, it's a, uh, one of the, the, the question that every religion has to answer and every single one of them is dodged. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, you know, there is there the problem of evil is 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 probably the most difficult uh, thing to to address when when you say God is all powerful, all knowing, all present, all good. You know, those, mm -hmm. the, the, that's the basic tenet of every Judeo Christian uh, uh, concept of God. When you say it's all of those things, then you have to explain well where did evil come from. And there are a lot of uh, a lot of Christians dodge and say, "Well, evil evil came from Satan." You say, "Well, who created Satan? Well, God. Well, why? You know." And if God is all, all powerful and everything is happening to His plan, how come He lets things happen? And even if you don't want to talk about 
person and things, tsunamis. Why yeah. does he let a tsunami happen? Right. Why does he let an earthquake? Why did he create a gl uh, an earth that has uh, plates that don't that bump up against each other and cause earthquakes and volcanoes? Right. You know, I, even if you take it off the human realm, there was an article in the New York Daily Record a couple of weeks, no, probably a month ago at this stage, from a young man, and he was explaining how it is he came to believe in God, mm -hmm. and how this is how it came. He got really, really drunk one night because he was mad at his girlfriend, and he was going to go drive home. And he couldn't find his keys. And they just disappeared. He never found them, even the next day. So he had to when call. When he was drunk. Right, when he was drunk, he lost his keys. Even the next day when he sobered up, still couldn't find them. They're just gone. He called one of his friends to come to the bar and take him home. So that's how he knows there's a God. God made his keys disappear. Now, this happened right around the time of Newtown, or I read the story around the time of Newtown, and I thought to myself, how come God didn't make Adam Lanz's keys disappear? If he couldn't have gotten in that car and gone to that school, he couldn't have killed all those children. Right. So, not to mention the thousands of DUI oh, yeah. cases and, and <laughs> yeah. deaths. And the, just the, for starters, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are lots of things. If God is actually reaching down and making people's car keys disappear, there are lots of other things He could do. Right. And it, again, and I, I read that article and thought to myself, and they say atheists are self-centered. Holy cow! Right. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, that that yeah, exactly. The, the, mm -hmm. This is a, this is what happens with with. Uh, uh, you, you get the you get the argument between uh, free will and uh, all good, all powerful, all knowing, and they aren't compatible. Mm -hmm. You you can't have free will where God is all knowing, because if God knows everything, can He know something that He can He know your choice in advance? Well, and what's the point of prayer? Right. Because he knows what's going to happen. Exactly. So what are you praying for exactly? Now, when I was uh, in high school, they would tell us that um, we were praying to know and understand God's will. And okay, fine, except that's not what people pray for. People right. pray that the math test is canceled and, you know, and that their team wins and that sort of thing. And then, of course, there's imprecatory prayer, too. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's prayer for people, bad things to happen to, to people you think are bad. Uh, and, yeah, well, yeah, praying for Hitler to be hit with a meteor. Yeah. You know, that, and that's uh, the kinder <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Purgatory. Yes. Um, but it, things like that happen all the time. And, uh, you know, so if God, I mean, it, it really is weird because if God has a plan, then why would you need to pray for God to enact his plan? Definitely. God knows what his plan is. And if you're asking for something that's not part of his plan, then the answer, you're going to obviously say the answer is no. But then you have to explain why pray in the first place. That's right. It, it's just sort of like he's making you grovel, you know. And then Even why do it in change. public in yeah. such a way that we have to, to uh, uh, point out that uh, uh, government public prayer is improper and all this other stuff that we're doing? Why don't you tell them about our website and our yes. Facebook page and other cool um, stuff like that? Yeah, we're, we have to wrap up today's show, but uh, our website is www.panonbelievers.org. Uh, we also have a Facebook page under Pennsylvania Nonbelievers, and uh, the URL, URL will be up in a moment. Uh, feel free to contact us if you have any show ideas or if you want to follow up on anything we've talked about today. And uh, we, we'd love to hear from you. Our next show is going to be on Tuesday, February 26th at 6 p.m. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. And we have, uh, there, there is stuff coming up. Uh, we, we have our York meeting coming up uh, at March the 2nd. March 2nd. That's also our annual meeting where we decide the, uh, who is going to be involved in our board. Uh, we have our elections and so on and so forth. And uh, for those who are members of our organization, please don't forget, uh, go out to our website. All the information is there and uh, come out and, and vote for our, our board members. Uh, that way we and this Thursday, we have our meeting in Lemoyne. Look That's on the website. Correct. You'll find it's, out about that. Yeah, so it's, it's at Isaac's in the West Shore Plaza, and we'd love to see you. And uh, we're going to be uh, wrapping up in just a few seconds. So I, uh, thank you for watching, and I hope...